All right. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Dr. Aliyah Baluch. Today we're going to be talking about respiratory viral infections, specifically under the auspices of transplant infectious diseases. So the goals of today is uh, kind of get a general introduction to respiratory viruses, looking at host factors, treatment options, the effect on morbidity and mortality, especially in the immunocompromised host. By all means, if you guys have questions, uh, ask me. And uh, as per standard, I will go around the room asking questions to you. So starting off with a real console to bring it home. This is, uh, of course, on a Friday at 4.45 PM. Um, this is a 62-year-old gentleman, has a history for ALL, oh, and I actually forgot to adjust his date. So his date of uh, diagnosis was uh, 2010, but his status was a match-related donor, sibling allergenic stem cell transplant in 2011. He presented to us this month with the, or end of last month, with respiratory symptoms, initially just sinus pressure, rhinorrhea, no sore throat or fevers. He visited his outpatient doctor who gave him levofloxacin, and he did complain of sick contacts at work as well as at home. On follow-up, he did a chest x-ray and had left lower lobe pneumonia, so he's worsening. He was admitted with fevers to the local hospital, treated with IV cefepime and PO azithromycin. He unfortunately had increasing um, oxygen requirements and thus got transferred to us. So looking at this, he has, as I mentioned, the stem cell transplant. He has history of skin, acute GVHD, SVT, for which he's on amio, history of Raynaud's phenomenon, hypothyroidism. He's both VRE and MRSA colonized. He has hypertension and hyperlipidemia. Family history really wasn't contributory. Social history, no tobacco, alcohol, or recreational Drugs, I mean, the alcohol is PRM, but not significant. He works as an assistant principal in the school system, sees a variety of age students, young children up to uh, 18 years old. He's had some travel in the last year or so to the Middle East and India, but nothing uh, very recent. And he is a usually very healthy marathon runner for fun. Medications at the time that we were consulted was already IV vancomycin, IV cefepime, PO azithro, and PO acyclovir, which is a standard prophylaxis, allergies, composine, robaxin, and just in general also about his medications, they were actually in process of weaning him totally off of his immunosuppression. So he's doing quite well from that perspective. On physical exam, the key elements is that he is normal tensive or a little bit hypertensive, but he's saturating 92% only on 3 liters. He's got a face mask on. He has no thrush. His heart is regular. He's got some scatter crackles bilaterally. And the rest of his physical exam is negative. So looking at his labs, he has a white count 9.51. And then his creatinine is 1.1, his albumin is a little bit low at 2.6, liver is okay, IgG, which just happened to have been done very recently, was 461. We had no recent CTs from our facility because he had been doing so well, but the CT from the outside hospital just two days prior to admission to us showed bilateral ground glass, pneumonia, and crazy paving. So, uh, and this would be his de-identified CT scan. Um, Maria, how would you describe this again? Looking at it, what would you describe this CT scan? So, I mentioned it already, but tell me, how would you describe this CT if you were looking at it? So, I mean, like I mentioned, it's the bilateral ground glass. So, unfortunately, as I'm attached, I can't point to it. Uh, let's see. Nope, that doesn't work. So, I mean, you could say for this particular slide, um, you know, he just has geographic areas of ground glass pneumonia. And then going on to the next slide, Luda, what is our, give me something on the differential for bilateral ground glass pneumonia. PCP, also known as PJP, Lily. Differential diagnosis. We said PJP. Next, what else? Um, it's a, a typical Atypical pneumonia. Christine, what else? Viral. Give me some examples, huh? Influenza. Influenza. Patrick. Rhinovirus. Jeff. 
we're going in a circle. Okay, but we're not. So give me another virus. RSV, yes, MITS. CMV, Maria, yes, MITS. EBV should not create this type of picture. We're talking about respiratory viruses. We'll get back to that. Adenovirus, yes. Okay, so moving forward. So what do we do at Moffitt? We're lucky enough now we have our respiratory viral panel. So does anyone know, can they name off three organisms that we check? We'll go back to Maria. So rhino comes on the RVP. Luda, what else? Parainfluenza, one, two, three. Lily, what else? Adeno. You seem to like Adeno today. Okay, so here we are, adeno, coronavirus, human metanumovirus, rhino, anero, which comes combined, influenza A and B, the human parainfluenza 1, 2, 3, and RSV. So with that, this kind of segues into our list, and actually there's even more bugs on this list that we don't necessarily check, but there is data out in the literature, so that's why we're talking about these. So RSV, influenza A, B, Paraflu, rhino, enero, metanumo, coronavirus, adenovirus, ki, wu, boca. So we look at for each virus pathogenicity, the level of invasiveness, uh, you know, how do you know who's going to have worse problems? So it depends on the type of transplant, your predisposition to a respiratory illness, when after transplant did you get the illness? Or do you have abnormal lungs at baseline and easier to tip over? The degree of immunosuppression, the allograft microenvironment, level of exposure to the outside world, which is a huge issue for lung transplant because the entire graph is exposed to the outside world. So firstly, RSV. So it is a negative sense single-stranded RNA virus from the family Paramyxoviridae. It affects infants. Uh, in your immunocompetent type patient population, stem cell and solid organ transplants, especially lung transplant, in temperate climates, which would be here. Uh, Incidence is higher during the winter months, though in the tropics it can be higher in the rainy season. There is no vaccine treatment. So polyvizumab, which is only for prevention, can be used, and you see it often used in children. For treatment, we have ribavirin inhaled IV or oral. Oral, though, is, gives you a risk for hemolytic anemia. So, Luda, what would we do to follow someone for possible hemolytic anemia? Um, check your T. Billy. T. Billy and their hemoglobin. So, I mean, essentially, you follow their hemoglobin um, because they're different dosing than the ribavirin, say, that we use for what disease, Lily? What other disease do we use ribavirin in? Hepatitis C, correct. So, and then we also have RSV IG or IVIG both being very expensive. So there is higher mortality actually in general for respiratory viruses if you're positive going into transplants. So that's why the standard actually here at Moffitt is unless your respiratory virus is cleared, you are not allowed to go forward with your transplant. So the reason why I pulled this from the CDC website is you can see the duration of the RSV season. And then as the next slide shows, where is that big circle is over Florida. Because of our temperature, we have a much wider and longer RSV season than, say, the rest of the United States. So we have to pay for our good weather, apparently. So talking about literature, RSV outbreak in a stem cell transplant ward at MD Anderson out in Houston. They had five cases, whereas usually they only have two to three per season. Um, there was the high-risk patients that were exposed. Remember, for prevention, you can use palivizumab. But all healthcare workers and regular visitors to the patients were screened. They had to do environmental cleaning as, as the way of controlling the outbreak. Four out of six patients went from upper respiratory symptoms to pneumonia. And it's when you have this progression that we have the increased risk for mortality, of which two patients died. So talking about RSV, oral ribavirin, and lung transplant. So again, as I mentioned, when you progress from upper respiratory illness to lower, you have a risk factor for BOS, bronchiolitis, obliterin syndrome, especially in lung patients. And they were looking at the five symptomatic lung transplant patients with RSV via nasopharyngeal swab or bronch during this time period. It was usually 
for their series 500 days post transplant and look how much their FEV1 dropped 21% during the infection. This is how actually, for example, at University of Alberta, how they measure um, if you're having graft dysfunctions. Each time you came in for clinic, you got an FEV1. That's a very significant drop. So they treated them with oral ribavirin. Their protocol was over 10 days with steroids and that they were able to return their FEV1 to baseline baseline and was maintained at follow-up, their follow-up being 565 days, so about two months later. There were no complications in their series with oral therapy and cost was significantly less than inhaled ribavirin and I'll tell you now, respiratory therapy does not like to give inhaled ribavirin. So looking here at Moffitt Cancer Center for our stem cell transplant patients, we actually have a standard operating protocol that you can actually look up through the intranet that has all the short version for all these infections and they actually include one for their specifically this is pulled for ribavirin for RSV so this is our protocol particularly at Moffitt if you're ever on call and this question comes up you don't have to look it up this like in the literature this is our standard so new RSV options on the horizon there is a small interfering RNA targeting uh, RSV replication, but it was a small series, um, only 24 patients, and they got standard RSV treatment with ribavirin versus randomized to getting the experimental therapy. At 90 days, they had new or progressing BOS was significantly reduced in the treating arm. Obviously, new therapy, it's always good to know from an infectious disease point of view what is on the horizon. Moving on to influenza A or B here, just because I like the history of medicine, H1N1, 1918, this was our Spanish flu pandemic, killed quite a number of persons in, around the world, and I always thought it was interesting, it's about twice as many persons killed compared to World War II. Killed Edward whom? Oh. Okay, Twilight Returns. No, I didn't. Though I read the book, I obviously missed that. I apologize. Uh, it's okay. So, <laughs> so, one in five people suffered from the disease. One in 30 people died. Um, possible natural reservoir being wild birds. And then H2N2 is the Asian flu pandemic. H3N2 is the Hong Kong flu pandemic. So what is it? So we have the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase. These are the H and Ns. So influenza, you have the sialate acid on the surface of cells, enabling them to enter and infect the cells. All these mechanisms are important so that then you know how to actually stop it with the drugs. So neuraminidase removes the sialic acid from the cell, enabling the newly assembled virions to be released in order to spread and infect other cells. So novel H1N1, it was found in the 2009-2010 where it predominated, and then still in 2010-2011 it was predominating <coughs> in Europe. H3N2 was really big in 2010, 2011 in North America. You have to be very careful when looking at flu data. Are you looking at Northern Hemisphere or Southern Hemisphere? Because I have a slide coming up soon talking about the new flu viruses uh, vaccine. So patient population, uh, when novel H1N1 first came out, it affected young children and adults. The theory being that Older persons who usually get the flu weren't this time around because maybe they had been exposed to it uh, previously when they were younger. And per the Northern Hemisphere, we get the flu in the winter season. Hence, Lily, when do we get flu shots? No, you want to be vaccinated before the season starts. So, Christine, when do we get the shots? September, October, sometimes in November. So vaccine, you have nasal, intradermal, intramuscular. The live ones are not generally recommended for SOT patients or new stem cell transplants. Intradermal tend to have more local reactions. Intramuscular is a standard of care, though you have to have a certain amount of platelets, especially notable in stem cell transplants. You, you don't want to create like a hematoma when you give them their vaccine. 
Family members should be vaccinated to create herd immunity as well. If a person receives live attenuated vaccine, they should wait seven days before coming in contact uh, with an SOT patient. And actually, that's from shedding. If a child is up for a transplant, like a liver, for example, and they require a live vaccine, Patrick, do you know how long they have to wait before they get their transplant? They are taken off the list for how long? Four weeks, traditionally four weeks. Yeah, but again, it depends on the severity. So, um, oh, if they, if they have it, okay. Hmm? That's because they, they shed more, more time than, than a normal person, no? Yes. So, going on for treatment, you have amantadine and romantadine options. You have also tamavir um, as well as zamanavir. But zamanavir cannot be given um, orally, only inhaled or IV. So, this was really big, especially when novel H1 first came out, that the uh, novel H1N1 was resistant to amantadine and romantadine, was sensitive to oseltamivir and zanamivir. Seasonal H3N2 was sensitive to oseltamivir and zanamivir. Seasonal H1, though, was kind of like the flip. It was sensitive to amantadine, romantadine, and zanamivir, but resistant to oseltamivir. So, infections in stem cell transplant with the uh, 2009 H1N1 was a retrospective review from 39 cases from October 2009 to January 2010 from Jordan. Median age of the patient population was 13.8 years. They got their tra uh, infection. You can see a wide range post transplant. Most of them were in allos, which are more immunosuppressed than autos. Most of them or one third of them were on immunosuppression, one third had GVHD, and 21% unfortunately also had lower respiratory infection. So 39% were hospitalized. The du uh, median duration of hospitalization was 4.5 days, but again, look how big that range is. And 8% um, of them required mechanical ventilation. So effectiveness and safety of influenza vaccination peds liver transplant. It was looking at retrospective analysis of 38 patients. They were comparing those who did and did not get immunized between 06 to 09. There was no significant difference between the groups in reference to acute allograft rejection, acute febrile illness, or influenza virus infection rate. Why do you think, Ray, is, why are they even mentioning allograft rejection? What is the concern? It's actually a relatively complicated thing that's discussed in vaccination um, issues in transplant, that you're introducing antigens to a patient that in theory you don't want them to get too many antigens because they could make HLA antibodies that get confused because you want them to make, you know, antibodies against the vaccine, right? So they become uh, immune. But the problem is they could get confused by doing that, that making then antibodies against their graft. So that's why they're always making sure when you give a vaccine, you're not having an upswing in your rates of rejection. So that's why it's always discussed when you look at a vaccination paper in solid organ transplant. Right, right. So, and there were no serious adverse effects in the vaccinated patients. The highest rate of seroconversion were seen in those with successive vaccination times three years. Um, Jeff, why do you think so? It could be multiple things, but give me a option. Yes, they got the vaccine three years in a row. Right. 
right? So just at the, on the most simplest line that now there are three years post-transplant. So in theory, every year out from transplant, you're weaning their immunosuppression. So then they have a better chance of creating a response. That's just one aspect of why um, the rest is way beyond the breadth of this lecture. So just in general, the farther out you're from transplant, the less immunosuppression you're on, the better chance you have to make a response to the vaccine. Okay, so, and then over the three-year uh, period, seroconversion was similar between transplant patients and healthy children. This doesn't always happen, especially in adults, but just per this series, that's what they found. Cutting-edge influenza vaccine work, um, they were looking, because transplant patients notoriously have uh, lower uh, rates of seroconversion, this paper looked at comparing intradermal versus intramuscular, both being inactivated, and there were no serious adverse effects. It was tolerated well in these kidney patients and friends, and that they kind of suggested that intradermal may have an enhanced immunogenicity in non-responders. So seasonal influenza vaccine 2012-2013. Now I just double checked this. These are the three vac um, serotypes in our vaccine this year. Two types of A, one type of B. MITS. Is it easier or harder with a vaccine to create a response to influenza A or influenza B? Which one though? Which one? So it's, it's harder to make a response to B. That is correct. That was a good guess. Huh? You see more B. That's one way to look at it. So does anyone, uh, Maria, do you know the difference between those three up there compared to last year's vaccine? Which one is the same? Which one's different? Does anyone know? So H1N1 is still the same. Uh, the A California 7 2009. The H3N2 in the influenza B is now different from last year. Okay, it, last year, for example, it was still the B Yamagata lineage, but slightly different. Ray, did you have a question? Uh, how do they determine the next year vaccine? How do they uh, so they look, for example, in China, because it kind of flows from the China side to us. What they see there is what they are theoretically seeing here then however many months later in our season. And they look, they look at all the patterns from that side as well as what's going on in the southern hemisphere because they have opposite timing from us. But, you know, usually from what I understand, there's a lot of groups that come together to make this decision because obviously the year that the pandemic came out, they made the slightly wrong guess and then we all got two shots. <laughs> Beg your pardon? Wait, wait. <laughs> Lily, what was your question? Honestly, I don't know. That's what we were thinking over here. Yeah. So. I, I apparently am North American centric. I can tell you for what we do. <laughs> so, moving on to human parrot influenza viruses. These are uh, envelope negative single stranded RNA viruses. Um, they're usually detected by cell culture, immunofluorescent microscopy, and PCR can cause croup. Um, human parent influenza virus 3, more associated with bronchi bronchiolitis, uh, pneumonia, and, some, and sometimes can also happen with parent influenza 1. Uh, it has a fusion and a hemagglutinin and neuraminidase glycoprotein spikes on the surface of the envelope affects infants and immunocompromised patients, common in the fall and winter, incubation, one to seven days. So again, people will ask you, you know, Dr. Kenny, how long is the incubation? And you could be like, ah, per my recent lecture, one to seven days. One to seven days. So it's inactivated by soap and water and lasts only a few hours in the environment. Again, no vaccine. Treatment, you can consider ribavirin inhaled IV PO or IVIG. And again, it has in vitro studies, especially against human parainfluenza 3, <coughs> appears to work better <coughs> in uh, lung transplant patients than in stem cell transplant patients. 
Yes. Do they have a protocol for it includes all of them. So yes, Christine, the next time you come over, you can call me and I will instruct you how to find it. Okay. So okay. risk hmm? We we treat We'll get to that. There's summary slides at the end. So <laughs> <laughs> Risk factors with progression uh, disease is being a child, GVHD, anti-lymphocyte therapy, lymphopenia, steroid use. Risk factors for death is lower tract disease and need for ventilatory support, presence of co-pathogens. Rhinovirus, enterovirus, which we see quite a lot of at Moffitt, the common cold. You know, there are 99 recognized types differing on surface proteins. The virus binds to ICAM-1 receptors on respiratory epithelial cells, and um, perhaps because of this mechanism, why we see rhinovirus being associated with asthma. Um, patient population occurs worldwide. In the United States specifically, is uh, increased risk during the autumn and winters, as we see already. And the vaccine, I mean, with 99 different serotypes that we already know of, you're not going to be able to do that. And the treatment, unfortunately, is just supportive. For human metanumovirus, it's an RNA virus. You know, it creates a respiratory infection with similar epidemiology and course as RSV. If it's a co-pathogen with other viruses, especially RSV, there's increased mortality, as I kind of alluded to before. It goes back to that same idea. If you have upper respiratory, it goes down the lower respiratory, increased risk for death. And it can lead to graft dysfunction like an RSV. It affects all patients. Unfortunately, it actually is all year round. No vaccine and treatment, reduced immunosuppression, again, may consider ribavirin. Just because I say that there's a possibility and there is some data doesn't mean you should, and that'll come up again at the end as well. Coronavirus, so this is an enveloped virus with positive sense single-stranded RNA affecting upper G, uh, respiratory tract and GI tract of mammals and birds. It's a rather large virus compared to the other ones, and you kind of have like a crown as you see on an electron microscope. It has a spike envelope membrane and nucleocaspid. Um, SARS. Uh, one of my attendings had some interesting stories of being in Toronto while there is a SARS outbreak and taking care of patients. can affect all patients, winter, early spring. There's no vaccine, no treatment, and for those of us who keep on top of the articles, there's apparently a new type of coronavirus coming out of Saudi Arabia, unfortunately. No, it actually, there's been just literally like a handful of patients, so no, thankfully not. Human rhinovirus and coronavirus and stem cell transplants, so at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center, they did a surveillance during the first 100 days post-transplant. They did collection based on symptom surveys and upper respiratory samples weekly. They were tested for those viruses, and then among the 215 patients, 30% um, had 67 infections. Cumulative incidence for 100 days was 22.3 versus 11.4. Um, median duration of shedding was three weeks, which is why it's so pertinent you're being kind to allow them to recheck a RVP in one week because a, like a person who is relatively not immunosuppressed should be able to say clear it. Some patients do, but I mean, here it goes. Their median duration of shedding was three weeks. So, you know, your pretest probability for clearing for one week in our patients becomes lower based on that. Lower respiratory uh, infection, uh, thankfully, only had um, two patients pre-100 days, and then after 100 days, they had an additional two patients. Bottom line, that rhinovirus and coronavirus are common, but not so much with lower respiratory symptoms as at this series said. Adenovirus, Lily's favorite bug of the day. Uh, is a non-enveloped double-stranded DNA virus can cause a wide variety of uh, symptoms, respiratory, GI, hemorrhagic cystitis, and conjunctival symptoms. So in stem cell transplants, you can actually find it in the stool as well if the patients uh, are viremic. 
Um, specifically for stem cell transplants, more often seen in allo compared to auto. Children more than adults. T cell depleted grafts. So, Patrick, you spent a lot of time with me. Who gets T cell depletion in our patient populations? Double cords, yep, as well as mismatches. They get T cell depletion. Uh, acute GVHD, and usually in the first 100 days. And solid organ transplant, um, for this uh, source I was looking at, is more renal or liver. Pediatric cases, again, T cell depletion, mismatch, uh, adenovirus serology, if in theory you have it. In solid organ transplant, the infection oftentimes is in the grafted organ, except in the kidney where you're going to see a lot of hemorrhagic cystitis. No, not usually. So again, based on that uh, specific resource, they obviously had access to that. Or they maybe did a look back. So um, When, again, all seasons, no vaccine treatment, decreased immunosuppression, you can consider Cidofavir, CMX001 if you have uh, access to it. And in theory, um, you know, gangcyclovir can uh, or might decrease frequency of adenovirus infections in stem cell transplant, but doesn't appear to help in solid organ transplant. Qi and Wu. So these are from the polyoma virus family. Qi is, uh, as you can see, Karolinska Institute founded it, and Wu is from Washington University. So they're documented upper and lower respiratory infections in children. And what children have, they can tend to infect their adult uh, stem cell transplanted parents, hence the issue. Up to 70 to 80% of patients were co-infected with other respiratory viruses. So in the literature, they're still trying to figure out what's the significance of these two infections. It's globally uh, found and don't really know enough to say, does it have a seasonal variation uh, definitely no vaccine and no treatment at this time. Uh, looking at this paper, they had 31 asymptomatic adult stem cell transplants. Um, they had sequential nasopharyngeal aspirates. Two of the 121 samples were positive, so both samples were four, 15 days post-transplant. And looking at symptomatic children with respiratory distress, they had 7 out of 486 samples positive for Wu and only one for Qi. So concluded it's not a serious pathogen for stem cell recipients or children even with symptoms. Boca virus. So this is DNA virus. It's uncommon in adult uh, immune competent patients, though there's been a case of a pediatric stem cell transplant with dissemination of Boca virus. Again, don't know the seasonal variation or doesn't appear to be one and no treatment, no vaccine. So Trying to categorize, we went through a lot of data here. Paramyxoviridae family includes RSV, paraflu, metanumo. All of them have fusion proteins and hemagglutinin neuraminidase. The virus family also includes measles, mumps, and numerous animal viruses like Nipa and Hendra. Trying to then categorize a different way, DNA virus has your adeno ki wu boca. RNA virus has RSV, influenza AB, human parainfluenza, human rhinovirus, human metanumavirus, human coronavirus. And then for Christine that asked for what about treatments, and the key thing is at the top, just because you can does not mean you should treat the patient, it depends on the clinical scenario. I got called in clinic. Dr. Baluch, can you please prescribe ribavirin for this person who has RSV? I looked at the patient. She looked theoretically fine. No fevers, no febrile illness. She had a, was not neutropenic and had no changes on her CT of chest. So in theory, this patient is very low risk for going from upper respiratory illness to lower respiratory illness. You weigh that against the risk of giving a patient ribavirin. And so we said no. We rechecked her RVP and it was already negative. So, bless you. Bless you. Are you sure you didn't bring something with you? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> All right. So looking at who has possible uh, support for in the literature, RSV, prophylaxis, polyvizumab, treatment, ribavirin, inhaled IV or oral, RSVIG, IVIG, influenza A and B, also tamivir, zanamivir, rimatidine, and amantadine, human parainfluenza 1 through uh, four, you can use ribavirin, inhaled IV or oral for rhinovirus. There is nothing. Human metanumovirus, you can consider ribavirin. For coronavirus, there is nothing. Adenovirus, cytofovir, and IVIG. Mm. Ray, what's the big side effect of cytofovir? Uh, yes, it's very, uh, can be nephrotoxic. So again, not a benign treatment. And uh, Jeff, I don't know if you, I kind of flew over it, but what was the special name of the lipophilic cytofovir that was a bunch of letters and a numbers? Okay, Mitz, did you catch that? Sorry. Anybody? What the name? Yeah. Yes, what are the letters? CMX001, because honestly, like it was discussed quite a lot at IDSA that they're trying to get permission for it to be FDA approved. So hopefully it's oral, it's much better tolerated. And the case that I saw that was a multi-organ uh, transplant who was about yay big, being quite small in the pediatric ICU, he had disseminated adenovirus and he tolerated the CMX001 very well. And we had very good numbers showing his quantitative adeno uh, decreasing while on the drug. So here we don't have the ability to get it. Uh, Ki and Wu, there is uh, no treatment. And Boca virus, there is no treatment. So why does it matter? Um, acquiring respiratory viruses and has the morbidity of the acute infection, the risk of going for upper respiratory to lower respiratory, increased risk of intubation, respiratory failure, and lung transplant, you can lead to a decrease in the FEV1 with stem cell transplants, increased risk for DAH, which stands for what MITS? DAH? Correct. And uh, Maria, how do you, on uh, when you do the bronch, how do you know you have diffuse alveolar hemorrhage? Because when they do the lavage. Yeah, you do the lavage, then what? The water, uh, it, it comes all with bloody, with, with blood. Right. And when it's not the age, the water is start to clear. Yes, that's correct. So the difference being that if you aspirate blood, it's a confined amount. So when you put in the lavage, it will clear. But when you're bleeding from the lungs, you'll continue to bleed, and so it will be continue to be bloody. So there was a prospective surveillance in lung transplants over three years, doing uh, seeing 93 patients with serial BALs. Uh, they were tested for 19 respiratory viruses via the Luminex uh, platform. They had approximately 6.2 BALs per patient. Respiratory virus was in 51.6% or at least one bronch. The samples, you can see the breakdown there. Rhinovirus is definitely on the top of that. And that within three months of a respiratory viral infection, 16 of eight, 48 patients, being about a third, had biopsy proven acute rejection grade 2 or higher or declined their FEV1 more than 20%. So obviously this is not ideal. Comparable time period in those without viral infection, only 3 of 45 per, uh, patients, being about 6.7%, had the equivalent amount of rejection or decline in FEV1, this being statistically significant. So a biopsy proven obliterative uh, bronchiolitis, or BOS, was diagnosed in 10 of 16 patients within one year of infection. Just again, trying to hit home that these patients, lung patients whose grafts are exposed to the world, increased risk for infection. If they get infection, then we have increased risk of having uh, graft dysfunction. So coming full circle back to our case, because that's what we started with, the bronch was done at 5 p.m. on a Friday, mumble, mumble, grumble, grumble, by our uh, wonderful f friends in the bronch suite. 
And uh, it was clinically consistent with uh, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, repeated washes, as was described by Maria, was progressively bloody and didn't clear. And then at the same time, while they were in the Bronx suite, we locked out and the RVP was positive for RSV. So, Maria, RSV treatment, we use what? Ribavirin, we use oral, and then Luda. In terms of the um, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, do you know how we treat it? Is it just supportive? It is supportive plus Lily? Yeah. High dose steroids. So um, he. For the uh, RSV, like we mentioned the SOP, we gave him ribavirin, monitor for hemolysis. He should get a re-PCT once he gets discharged in four to six weeks. For the DAH, he got high-dose steroids. I double-checked. They chose to give him. There's no real right answer on the dose. So um, f for his particular case, he got solumedrol, 250 milligrams IVQ, six hours. And then he improved so fast that actually in about four days, he got discharged.